uh, including the, uh, the very next uh, presentation that we're going to have. Uh, we did something new, um, and we're going to, uh, if I can have the slide for the exploration update. Uh, so for the exploration uh, systems update, uh, typically we have the leadership um, out of either the, uh, the NASA team or for the contractor team. Um, well, we asked uh, uh, Mr. Tom Whitmire about uh, putting this together, and he said, well, let's, let's do something just a little bit different. So I'm going to allow my friend Tom Whitmire to tell you about it. So uh, I'll introduce Tom. Uh, Tom is a longtime friend of mine. He is the acting associate director uh, for the exploration systems. And um, he may not be that well known to, uh, to those of you in Huntsville. He's very well known to us who have worked shuttle and, and exploration. And he's worked at headquarters for, I think, uh, 30 years, 20 years in the civil service. Uh, I've worked with Tom for, uh, for a, a long time uh, as, a, as a child. But um, I'm happy to have Tom uh, come here and uh, introduce the panel. So Tom and the panel, if you guys want to go ahead and take your seats, I'm going to let Tom come up. Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Tom Whitmire, um, and also uh, similar to what uh, Steve did, let me say hel welcome and hello for Ken Bowersox. Ken's back in D.C. right now. He's getting ready. We're doing some budget submission stuff and his uh, testimony next week, so he wishes he could be here. I'm kind of helping to represent Ken today, as is Marshall Smith, and so you'll hear from Marshall later on. Um, Alan, Steve, Chris all talked about there's a new generation uh, coming. And this panel that we wanted you to have an opportunity to meet today is part of that new Artemis generation. They represent that new leadership, and I'm really glad you guys are here to do this. The one thing we've all been reminded of at headquarters is we need another generation to kind of get going and take over some of the stuff we're doing. And so that's why they're here today, and I think you're really going to enjoy that. So for the actual topic for the panel, uh, we gave that a lot of thought, too. And... Um, I can't think of a better topic that's more important or appropriate or in, in, in symbolic of uh, Dr. Von Braun. Um, when you watch a movie or you read a book or you go see a, a TV show and they talk about uh, exploration to distant certain planets and surfaces, they often show a launch vehicle launching up and they show uh, something landing on that distant surface. What they typically don't show is they don't show you the part that the work that goes in to get ready for that. We have a, the test programs, the engineering analysis, all the work that we have to do to be able to do these complex and difficult missions that are coming up. Um, for Artemis One, for exploration system development, we put a lot of uh, effort. It's an extensive test program. It's a very detailed test program. You're gonna, the panel's going to talk to you about the test program, but let me assure you, uh, doing the type of things that we're about to do are very difficult to do, and it takes a test program of this scale and this uh, um, nature to be able to pull it off. So I can't think of anything for a Von Braun conference that would be more uh, living legacy of what Dr. Von Braun meant to NASA, meant to this agency, uh, meant to the work that we've done. Uh, this test program is exactly the kind of thing that he started more than 50 years ago during the Apollo program. And for us at NASA, we've taken that legacy. We've built upon that legacy. We've extended that legacy to where we are today. And this panel of our new Artemis generation is going to tell you what we're going to do for that test program. It may not be as exciting as the actual launch. It won't be as exciting when we land on the lunar surface. But let me tell you, and Dale's, Dale's smiling at me, this is what gets you there. And so this is kind of Dale's legacy and a few other, like Gary Lyles and a few other folks that have really led a legacy for us. And I'm honored to have a panel here today that represents that new Artemis generation. And I'm honored to share with you what Exploration System Development is doing to get ready to go to the moon. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the panel. How are we doing this morning? Uh, oh, come on, guys. How are we doing this morning? Uh, that's better. There's more coffee back there if you guys need some, okay? <laughs> so um, once again, guys, welcome to the 2019 um, Von Braun Symposium. It is an honor to be here um, to talk to um, colleagues. Um, you know, you guys, along with NASA, have played a major role in everything that we do um, for the benefit of, of mankind, right? Um, so without you guys um, partnering with NASA, um, leading us to the, the next generation of space exploration, which is um, Artemis. Um, with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce, well, first of all, my name is Yves Lamoth, right? I'm from the Kennedy Space Center. 
Um, and um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce um, our panel. Um, first off, we have Yasmin Ali, who's the docking manager from uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. Let's please give, a, give her a big round of applause. We also have um, Heather Haney, um, the core stage test and verification lead from the Marshall Space Flight Center. Please give her a hand. <laughs> and finally, we have um, Charlie Blackwell Thompson. She is the Artemis launch director from the Kennedy Space Center. <laughs> All right, so, so um, the way this is gonna work, folks, um, they have um, a series of charts that they're gonna go through. Um, and after they go through the charts, um, we'll have um, some time that we'll be able to ask some questions. Sound like a plan? Yeah. All right, so let me ask you one more time. How are we doing this morning? Great. All right, here we go. <laughs> so let's, we're going to go ahead and, and um, kick it off with a short um, video um, real quick. Um, that's going to kind of help um, frame what we're going to talk about, and then we're going to get into the presentation. Oh, the oh, let me take that back. No video. <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get right into the presentation, folks. Here we go. That's okay. We'll have plenty of videos here to show you. Next chart. All right, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit just about the Orion testing that we're doing today. Um, what I'm going to cover today is just a snippet in time of what we've worked on in the last few months and um, where we're going in the ne next couple of months. You know, this is a small portion of just Artemis One related and qualification testing, but really the program is really busy right now and it's a very exciting time. We're working on multiple vehicles at the same time and it's exciting. Um, definitely exciting place to be and to be working. And so recent testing I'll talk to you about is Aston Abort 2 last July, um, our PQM, our uh, prop qualification module and that testing that we've done and then some, um, some last motor abort testing that we've done as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, Plumbrook and where we're headed for our deep space environmental testing and that's coming up. So next chart. All right, so this is Artemis One, um, and it is, uh, this is our crew module, and it is ready to go um, for, for um, it is fully installed. It has, you know, thousands of piece parts that have come together and installed and put in here. We've tested it, um, and it, uh, when it started, it started as just a, a pressure vessel that came out of a chute. Um, and then, you know, a lot of hard hours that have gone into this and making this work. We also currently have our Artemis II as well. That's also in the operations and checkout at KSC. Um, and it's just coming out of the clean room. It's got all its plumbing in it as well. Um, and so its, it's next phase is going to get ready for all of its hardware to get installed into it as well. The next chart. And this is our service module. Um, so our service module, if you can, I'm not sure if the video is playing. The ser service module, thank you. Um, it's responsible for the power and propulsion of Orion. Um, and it is a contribution from ESA, um, so from the European Space Agency. And it was actually manufactured by Airbus and Bremen. Um, and it arrived to KSC last November in 2018. And so... Um, there it's moving and getting ready into, uh, to get into the acoustic bay for testing. Next chart. All right, so this is currently where we are for Artemis 1. Um, it is in its uh, crew and service module is fully stacked um, and it's ready to go. Um, Artemis 1 is, when I look at Artemis 1, I look at it as the proving ground. I look at this um, as the next generation that's going to really take um, the first woman to the moon. And um, this is the vehicle that's going to get us there. And so um, this vehicle is ready to go. And in a few months, we're just finishing up a few processing things, and then we will be ready to um, send it off to Plumbrook here in the next month. All right. And now I get to share with you about Aston Abort 2. 
Um, you know, it's a really interesting flight. You know, the team worked really hard. This flight wasn't actually supposed to occur uh, when it did, but the team worked really hard to accelerate. When do you ever hear things accelerating? Well, the team accelerated this flight about, about eight months, and they were able to pull it off. And so Ascent Abort 2 demonstrated a launch abort system um, to enable the crew module to separate successfully um, away from um, the launch vehicle. And I'll, I got a video for you. Next chart. So it, it occurred just this past July, um, and it was really important for this flight test to demonstrate an abort at max Q. The team worked really hard to try and get the trajectory um, just right to hit max Q. And we start the initiation of the sequence for the launch abort system at about six miles and, um, in altitude, and we're traveling about 1,000 miles per hour. So one of the things that we like to look at um, during this is the stability, um, the stability characteristics and the reorientation dynamics of the vehicle, especially during the separation. And then you'll start to see here, one of the things that we wanted to look at as well was the service module to, see, to, um, to last separation. And you'll start to see the reorientation. And the next separation following the reorientation we like to look at. So stability is key here, right, as we're looking at this. And so not only do we study the motor's performance, But we study all of these dynamics. We look at the structural integrity of the last as well. And then you'll see it go and hit, nail a perfect trajectory and come back down. Now, can anyone guess how long it took before the first tumble? Because it's an aerodynamic dream. How long do you guys think? We had no shoots on this test. Any guesses in the audience? No? No guesses? All right, it took about a minute. It took about a minute until the first tumble. Um, and so, you know, our, aer our aerodynamic guys definitely got something out of this test as well. Um, obviously, we already tested all of our shoots. We had a, a, a big test campaign um, that we did with our qualif qualifying our parachutes, and so we did not do that on this test. So this was primarily to simulate the ascent of board, and it was successful. Um, so next, I'll move on to our... Um, our PQM testing that we call for the prop qualification module. And um, this is a testing that we do out at White Sands. And this testing um, is, is extremely important if we want to make it to the moon. Um, and because it tests out all the dynamics that um, occur between, uh, for our service module prop, between our auxiliary engines, our main engine, and then our RCS thrusters as well. Um, so I got a video for you on this one as well. And so you can see all eight auxiliary thrusters firing. And then the main engine is down there in the middle. Um, and then the RCS thrusters on the side. And this simulated a board to orbit. So just in case, um, just in case that the ICPS uh, doesn't get us into the right orbit, then the service module can do that, and then we can have some time to react to that. So this was a 12-minute firing of all the Orion prop system, um, and this is just one of the few that we're doing in our test campaign out at White Sands. So this is some additional testing, and if you click on the pictures, um, you can see the, the different testing for this picture. Um, this is a few tests we have for the jettison motor. Um, so the last consists of three solid rocket motors. We got the jettison motor, the abort motor, and the attitude motor. And so this is one of the, these were three series of tests um, that we performed leading up to AA2 this past year. That's the attitude control motor.
We can go on. All right, so where are we headed? Well, we're headed to Plum Brook. So we're gonna take the crew and service module and we're gonna go to Sandusky, Ohio and Plum Brook to perform some deep environmental um, testing out there. The next chart, I got a video for you. It's a four month campaign that's gonna go undergo a series of test environmental testing. We've also done other ESM tests out there, and um, we've done the crew module as an abort um, testing as well for acoustics testing. It's a state of, it really is a state of art facility. Orion will start in the high bay when it arrives. Upright Orion and put it in order to put it into its test stand. You like the music? A little bit more edgier. Test programs have used this facility as well. The Mars lander systems, um, deployable solar arrays have used this as well as the International Space Station for hard, different hardware tests. So thermal back, EMI testing, and then we move into the Vive facility. It is an 18 foot diameter um, test table, so pretty large. 16, um, 16 vertically mounted uh, actuators and four horizontal mounted actuators. And it's just amazing to go into this acoustics test facility. You feel very small in this acoustics test facility as you walk into it. Um, but it's a chamber that can reach over 163 dB. And so, pretty outstanding. So following Plumbrook, then we head back to KSC. We're gonna do a little bit of processing there and then we're gonna hand it over to EGS. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Charlie. All right, let's see, is this? Let's see, is the mic working here? All right, there we go. So, um, I'll happily take that handover from you. Um, we're excited at KSC uh, to get the flight hardware. Um, I am Charlie Blackwell Thompson. I am the Artemis Launch Director, and uh, it is my pleasure today to talk to you a little bit about um, our planning uh, as we get ready for launch and our test activities at KSC. Uh, let's go ahead and flip to the next chart. You know, over the weekend, I had the opportunity to look at the program uh, and this morning during the introductions, the, the words exploration is the work of generations. And that really struck me, you know, because I thought about when I first came to KSC back during the shuttle program and how I had the opportunity to really um, continue down a path that others had laid for me and finish out the program in 2011. And I think about what we're doing today and I look at the test activities and, and when I look at you know, my home program and back at KSC, the changes in the infrastructure and the testing that we're doing, getting ready for the flight hardware, I think about laying that foundation for a program that does put the first woman and the next man on the moon and then lays a path for Mars. So it's a really exciting time um, for us. The, now I'll talk to the charts that I actually have on the, on the, uh, on the, on the screen here. So you can see in our charts, um, it's a collage here. You can see our multi uh, payload processing facility is up on the one side. Let's see up, up on this side of the chart. Um, that's where we'll do the final servicing for Orion with their hypers as well as uh, high pressure gases. That facility is essentially, uh, the GSE is installed and tested. 
um, our what we call verification and validation, our VNV testing uh, of those requirements for um, that GSE and that facility is 95% complete. We'll finish that up in just the next couple of weeks. So uh, you can see some hardware arrivals that are coming down at the bottom of the screen. Um, the water flow in the middle that was playing when I was talking, that's our IOPSS, our ignition overpressure and sound suppression. Um, that picture is our mobile launcher. Uh, out at the pad and uh, and actually right now as we speak it should be going up the slope uh, returning to the pad after Hurricane Dorian came through and we we moved her back to the VAB for as a safe haven um, we have testing for our IOPSS system that will be coming up on Friday and Saturday in fact I'm flying back for that um, that testing is all about protecting the vehicle uh, at liftoff and, and protecting and mitigating any kind of acoustics hazard. Hundreds of thousands of gallons of water that flow out of an elevated tank through the pad plumbing and onto the to the ML deck. And one of the things that we're looking at as part of that is the coverage on that deck, making sure that we've got water all the places that we need. You can see on the other side of the chart, uh, the vehicle assembly building or the VAB, the platform set there, we have a 10 platform set that gives us access to the outer mold line of the vehicle. All those platforms are brand new. Um, we took out the ones over in High Bay 3 from the space shuttle program that allowed us access um, during that program. And you can see that they've been completely reconfigured. And then um, the picture at the bottom is uh, a picture from the pad and some work on the flame deflector. So a lot of test activity that we have going, going on back in the EGS program back home at Kennedy Space Center. Next chart, please. And I'll just hit some of the highlights. There's a lot um, that we have, and there's a video as well, just uh, as some of the other folks are going to show you that kind of shows some of the testing that's going on. But here's a picture from the vehicle assembly building. It's one of our arm swings. It's actually for the core stage, the inner tank unit, the CSITU. Um, it provides uh, purge, command and data, um, electrical interfaces. That's all been tested out. We tested all of the umbilicals offline before they were installed on the mobile launcher. So just as Yasmin talked about this kind of incremental test, we did the same thing, tested all of them. Um, what we're doing here is actually the arm swing. It's very important in the timing for us, especially from a launch perspective, because they're T0 umbilicals, which means that we want to swing them right at T0, um, not before, because we want to maintain those critical services to the vehicle. Um, but at the same time, we want them to get back and away so that they're not, they don't pose any risk to the vehicle during the ascent. And that's just one of the tests that we did in the VAB. Uh, next chart, please. Here's our, uh, our ML. It's rolling out as it was rolling out to the pad we did back in August of last year when we finished up work. Um, the, the ML, as you notice, as it approaches the pad, pad B is our pad um, that we'll launch Artemis from. If you notice, it's a clean pad concept. All of the infrastructure from shuttles been removed. Uh, and so your infrastructure, for the most part, your tower is located on your mobile launcher itself. A little bit different than what you would have seen with an MLP mm -hmm. back in, in shuttle. So that was built at the park site. Um, once that construction, or most of that construction was finished at the park site, we did roll it out to the pad about a year ago, uh, just to make sure that we had a good fit check. Uh, and then it came back to the VAB and we went through our um, VNV testing there, what we call our multi-element VNV. Again, each of these things are tested and we put them together. Um, we just recently, this summer, as we completed our test regime in the VAB, we rolled out to the pad uh, to start our, what we call multi-element VNV between the pad and the mobile launcher. Um, we intend to finish that up this fall. We are down to um, a couple of more IOPSS water flows. We have two coming up, and then we have one final one that will uh, follow that. And then uh, we have our cryo flows at the pad, just ensuring that all of our, all of our piping, our command and control center, our, that we're tied in uh, and demonstrating our capability there um, with our cryos. And then we're finished up at the pad and ready for that flight hardware. And then we'll roll back to the VAB. Next chart. Um, and then, um, you know, we think a lot about, and you'll see in the video, and I know Tom talked a little bit about thinking about launch and, and, uh, and the landing, landing on the moon. Uh, but part of our team's job also is that once Orion's work on orbit is done uh, and it comes back home and lands in the Pacific Ocean is for the EGS team to go out and do the, uh, 
do the, the landing and the recovery ops. And so as part of that, you have to test those things too, just like we test the things leading up to launch. We need to make sure that our processes, our plans, our timelines, uh, and our teams are trained. And so uh, Melissa Jones back at KSC leads our landing and recovery team, and they have a series of underway recovery tests where they actually go out and retrieve the uh, crew module and validate and verify all of their timelines and their equipment, and they do that um, with the U.S. Navy. Let's see, I think our next chart is um, a video that looks at some other testing operations as we call our path to the pad. So hopefully the video gives you a feel for the testing that we have going on, going on back home at KSC. Again, as we prepare for the arrival of the flight hardware, making sure that we meet the specifications and the requirements for the services and support that that flight hardware hardware needs. Um, I would be remiss as a launch director if I didn't tell you that one of my favorite parts, and I didn't talk about it in the slides, but I'll take a minute now, is you noticed in there we talked about it's not only about testing the hardware, testing your, your procedures, testing your timelines, but it's also about testing your team. And so back at KSC and Frying Room 1, we have already started our launch team training, um, which is where we get our teams in the, in the firing room. We go through the operations of launch. We go through the timelines. We have a suite of simulators and emulators that are hooked up. We, we uh, put problems in to begin testing and making our team ready for launch day uh, because we want to make sure as those final minutes and seconds tick off the countdown clock that our team is prepared uh, for whatever the ground or the flight hardware might throw at us on that day. Um, we also have a busy fall as we look toward the end of the year. Uh, you can see the core stage pathfinder, actually the delivery of that's going to come at the end of this month. Uh, and so we're excited to get that, uh, that hardware to KSC. Um, our software is built incrementally and so uh, right now we are working on our SC, what we refer to as SCCS 5.0. Um, our next um, delivery of software and what is planned as our final delivery of software in terms of capability uh, comes at the end of the year, so we're excited to, to get that behind us. And then for us, um, as we kind of finish out the end of the year, you know, our systems will be complete, our testing will be complete, and uh, we're, we're anxious for that flight hardware to get there uh, so that we can begin to integrate that and then test it and make sure that it's ready for launch. I'll hand over to, to Heather. So hi, good morning. I'm Heather Haney, and as Eves has already said, I'm the test and verification lead uh, for core stage element here at Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, next chart. So here are a few pictures of the hardware that we have for SLS. If you look in the top left-hand corner, that's some um, four of our RS-25 Artemis One flight engines. Uh, and to its right is the CIDF cube, known as the System Integration Test Facility and Qualification. Uh, it's um, for some of our avionics. And then below it, you'll see, um, you know, 
core stage is made up of five parts. So the, the long piece there is four pieces of those five together. If you notice just to the left of it is the engine section, patiently waiting to be integrated with the rest of the core stage. And in the bottom left-hand corner is a Artemis One booster motor segment. So this next chart that I'm going to show you is actual video of some of the um, progress that we've made. Uh, here is a, a breakout of what makes up the core stage. Um, you will see um, here is a, a LOX tank being integrated with the inner tank. Next is the um, forward skirt. And then you'll see technicians finishing up most of that um, integration. And then you'll see that, taking that over, and they're going to integrate it in with the liquid hydrogen tank. Here's a close-up view of that integration. A little panorama of that. Um, so um, Artemis One Core Stage manufacturing is 80, 80 to 90 percent complete. As it's already been said, the engine section is complete as well as the functional testing. Um, the uh, booster stage, or uh, well, the Boeing stage controller, is has begun integration into the SIDF Q, where they will be. Um, testing that, doing risk reduction for the Boeing stage controller uh, for validation testing that's upcoming uh, starting next month. The boosters, all 10 motor segments are complete and they're ready to be uh, shipped to Kennedy. Uh, also the um, Artemis One launch vehicle spacecraft adapter is in uh, final preparations at Marshall as well as the um, ICPS that's been mentioned, that's the interim cryogenic propulsion stage and the Orion spacecraft adapter are um, in storage waiting to be integrated. So next chart. Here's a picture of a QM2 motor firing in Utah. Uh, this next chart will show, actually show you footage of that as well as some motor segments being um, moved within the factory. So if we can go to that next video. So here this will show you we're going to focus on the boosters. There's an aft segment with part of a nozzle attached. The next one will be a uh, booster segment being moved through the factory. There it is on some of the transportation being moved to storage. And this next, what you'll see next is time-lapse video of an actual QM2 motor firing. Here you'll see the throat plug being expelled from the nozzle. Sorry, we don't have sound for this. It would be really cool to hear. Oh, there is some. Good. And the audience, of course, is the public loves to see these, so it's, it's a good... Um, they come in and enjoy this because this is for, for all of us. Uh, next chart. So NASA and Northrop Grumman have completed three full-scale development to engine of uh, three full-scale development tests as well as two full-scale qualification tests. Um, some some key facts about the boosters are uh, each booster is 177 feet tall or 17 stories tall. That's actually taller than the um, uh, Statue of Liberty. Uh, a booster is 12 feet in diameter. And an actual one booster will burn almost 1.4 million pounds of propellant uh, in two minutes. And also, a booster's thrust is more than 14 uh, four-engine Boeing 747s at full takeoff power. Next chart. Here's a picture of an RS-25 hot fire test at Stennis. And if we go to that next chart, we'll show some video of that. Here we show you on the rocket where we're focusing. It's the engines. Uh, this is actual footage of the RS-25 being placed in their shipping containers so they can be shipped from Stennis to Michoud. Here is one being placed into the test stand. Technicians finishing up, and here is the actual hot fire test. And there you see the impressive plume of smoke exiting the flame trench. If you look in the left, there's the rainbow, and we'll show another chart, another um, angle of some drone footage that shows a really good view of the hot fire test. So earlier this year, engineers completed a four-year series of um, development engine tests that, to adapt the RS-25 engine to the SLS performance and environment requirements. And they also updated the engine controller and um, software. There were a total of 32 tests totaling roughly 15,000 seconds of hot fire test time. And the uh, testing, and in, in, it was tested at, a, the engines were tested at 113% of the original thrust plan so that we can prove that it can run safely at the planned 111% for um, SLS. 
Next chart. So here's a little bit of what I've been involved in as well. Uh, these are a couple of pictures of our current cord stage testing that's going on at Marshall. We, in the left-hand side is the liquid hydrogen structural test article in its test stand, and on the right hand is the liquid oxygen tank being placed into the test stand. We just finished up the uh, liquid hydrogen uh, qualification test series, and so we're off reviewing that data. And the uh, liquid oxygen STA will, uh, that qualification test series will start um, sometime next month. So we'll show, the next chart will show the actual installation of these into the test stand. On the left is the liquid hydrogen. Once it arrived at the dock and was, it was 24 seven ops until uh, installed into the test stand. Engineers and technicians worked very hard. And on the right hand side is the locks going into what we call the bird cage into the test stand. So this has been very exciting times to be a part of a, of a test campaign that's the largest structural test campaign since the space shuttle. Uh, and it's almost 80% complete. As I've mentioned, the liquid hydrogen tank will soon be deemed qualified. Liquid oxygen structural test article will uh, start its test campaign next month. Uh, a couple of other structural test articles that have been qualified are the engine section. It was done earlier, finished up early last year, and the inner tank was finished up early this year. And I uh, want to mention some other things that Marshall has done is the, they have completed the integrated structural test of the um, LVSA, the OSA, and, and as well as the ICPS. Next chart. Here's a picture of the Pathfinder outside of the B2 test stand at Stennis Space Center. And on the right hand side is the Pathfinder being uh, lifted into the B2 test stand. The, the Pathfinder is serving as a training aid to validate move procedures and just um, we don't want to be the first time that the core stage is in, placed into the test stand to be it. We want to, this is a, a good training process for the team. Went very well. Uh, this next chart is an um, animation of what it will look like putting the core stage Artemis 1 into uh, B2. So there you'll see the spider um, leaving the barge, Pegasus. The GSC, ground support equipment, uh, will go back and retrieve the core stage one, where the, uh, the spider will be uh, installed onto the core stage, lifting brackets attached. And then it will be lifted into the stand where we will actually do what we call a green run test. There's a wet dress, a wet dress rehearsal, rehearsal as well as a hot fire test. This will be the first time that the fully integrated system will be um, tested together. So then after it will be removed from the stand, we will do some refurbishment while we are there at uh, Stennis Space Center, then uh, it will be loaded back onto the ground support equipment, back onto the barge, and this way we will send it over to Kennedy where they will prep it and get it ready for launch. So there it's leaving and headed off to Kennedy. Um, you may ask why do we do what is green run testing? So green run testing is the first full up testing of the SLS core stage and all of its uh, systems. Uh, this testing replicates launch procedures even to the point of firing the four RS-25 engines simultaneously as during launch. Um, uh, it also is, you may ask why do, why do we want to test it? So as you know, SLS has not flown yet. Uh, it is being tested prior to its maiden flight uh, so that we can identify and address any issues earlier rather than later. Uh, we want to make ensure mission success and, and most importantly we want to ensure that our astronauts are safe. And I believe that's my last chart. So now we're going to open it up to some uh, questions. If you have questions, please go ahead and raise your hand, um, and the panel will be, happy, will be happy to answer any of your questions. We have one up there. All right. 
First, Ron Burke from the Aerospace Corporation, thank you. Um, that was fantastic, worth the price of admission. Um, uh, with all that testing, there has to be a tremendous amount of data that is being collected. Uh, can you help us to understand how all that data is assembled and how it's essentially forensically reviewed and made available for use uh, to inform operational uh, activities? So in our structural test campaign, I'll add a little bit just from Marshall, and I know because we all have a little bit of testing involved in this, so uh, for us, we, we um, ensure that our data is, is good. We go through, um, after we finish a qualification series, we take several weeks to go off and review that, do a bracket configuration meeting where we say, hey, we are good, we've qualified it. We've had the community to review it, not just um, Marshall, but we have our Boeing counterparts, we have other centers to make sure because um, they're going to ultimately be the receiver of what we have just qualified. Good morning, Dan Masnick. Thanks, uh, Nessa Langley. Thanks very much. That was a really great overview, um, outlining everything, all the progress that's been made. I guess this question is probably to Charlie. In terms of Pad B um, facilities, are there any special design considerations for hurricane proof? We just had Dorian come through, and luckily it didn't hit the, the Cape but just to make sure it's still operational to the greatest extent possible after something like that? Um, so, so I don't know if I would say that we have anything specifically hurricane proof. We certainly have natural environments requirements that we, that we design to, that we design our structures to. Um, one of the, I would say, positive things that if we looked at shuttle, um, the shuttle pad, right, we have a lot of infrastructure out at the pad. And one of the features of our current pad is a clean pad concept, which really minimizes your exposure every day, not just during hurricanes, but certainly minimizes your exposure to the elements because, you know, we're, we're right on the ocean. Uh, but it also allows you to pull back some of that key infrastructure, if you will, because it's more mobile than it was back in shuttle. And so I think this last, while we, we never want to have hurricanes and we never want to have to roll off of the pad, I think this last exercise was, um, was good in a way because we were able to go and look at our timelines, demonstrate that capability before we get flight hardware, uh, because you know we monitor the weather, look at it ahead of time, but, but really have Having the mobile launcher and being able to move that that back, I think, puts us at an advantage to where we were historically, where we had a lot of infrastructure and a lot of GSE at the pad. This allows us to come back uh, to a safe haven environment. Mitch Fletcher, Arrowhead System Engineering. What's the status of integrated software VNV for all these different pieces that have to come together? At least on Orion, uh, we're currently working with, um, you mean integrated across all the vehicles? Yeah, so we're gonna do some joint runs, right? Joint mission sims and joint runs where we're running in, our, in the loop our, um, our ITL, our test labs while we're running our mission sims and we're doing testing then. Charlie, you wanna elaborate? Yeah, I would, I would, I'll let um, these ladies speak to the testing that happens at their home programs, but I will, I'll talk about how we do that integration of software um, for a day of launch environment. And so our teams actually go and test with our ground software um, in their test lab so that we make sure that we are communicating and then compatible both with our ground software and the various releases of their flight software. We do that in an integrated software test lab. We do that both with SLS. We do that with Orion. Then we have a suite of emulators at KSC um, that we um, hook together. And, uh, and so it looks like we call it a stack on pad configuration because it looks like the vehicle that's stacked on the pad in a launch day configuration. We test our software against that as well. Uh, and then uh, as Yasmin was saying, we also have um, various simulations and test activities where we have the First, the test activities are we have various tests as we get integrated that we tie in the other centers. And so not only do we have the vehicles talking or the vehicle elements talking together, we're also talking back uh, through the launch control center has the command and control functions, but data is sent out both to JSC, to mission control, and to the MER there, as well as to the HOSC and the engineering center here at Marshall. And we're all 
um, looking at that data together and making sure that it's working the way that we expect it to. We also do day of launch uh, countdown sims and we'll do a, a wet dress sim um, where we are, um, each of our control centers has their software up and operating uh, and that we have the vehicle software. And so there's many tests that lead up to that. And then also in addition to that, um, we also do what we call green run following, which is when they do the green run um, at Stennis, uh, our teams will be in the control center following along uh, and looking at our displays and making sure that when we go through those time critical operations that, you know, that the data uh, and the way in which that we're looking at it, interpreting it uh, in the control center is as we expected. So there's a number of different ways that we're testing the software. I would say it starts off incrementally where we're all testing our piece, then we start to put it together uh, in in bigger chunks and we test it and then ultimately leading up to those day of launch uh, and those mission sims and and then ultimately with something like wet dress where we have the flight hardware all talking together um, and along with all of the control centers and their ground software yeah and for early development we've developed um, something called Orion in the box um, so we delivered that to um, ESA as well so that uh, folks can use that to integrate and do software testing. We're also going to be using that for future missions when we move towards de early development with Gateway as well. Um, so that's how we have been generic since we're moving towards this concept of Orion in the box to support integrated software testing. Okay, I think we have one more question right up here. Good morning. Um, Brian Valdez, Pathways Internet, MSFC. Uh, so all the uh, handling and maneuvering that you've done so far on LAS, the rocket boosters, the, both the LH2 tanks, LOX, are you planning on following the same procedure with the, these qualification articles and the, t and the flight hardware? Uh, yes, that's the, the purpose of why we're doing it all up front, say like with Pathfinder, that was our training tool so that the team could train and make sure that their move procedures are validated and there's and, and work out all the kinks prior to actually moving the first Artemis one core stage. Okay, thank you and uh, thanks to the panel here.